So the periodic table is something you've definitely seen many, many times before, and you're going to continue to see it throughout your university studies, even outside of just your chemistry courses. So it comes up in material science, physics, biology, and many other disciplines. And this is why chemistry is often called the central science, because it really ties into pretty much every kind of science and engineering. So having a good fundamental grasp of chemistry is really important if you're going into any STEM discipline. Uh, and it really makes sense because everything in the universe is made up of elements, whether it's something naturally occurring like DNA or something man-made like solar panels. So you probably know already that the periodic table is so important because it's a simple way for us to list all the elements that humans have discovered in one handy chart. But that's really only a little bit of why it's so important. So there's really key information that we can get about every single element on here. Uh, and even more excitingly, scientists can use the periodic table to predict all kinds of properties that elements and molecules will have. And that's really incredible if you think about it. Uh, for example, we can predict that chlorine and fluorine will react in really similar ways because they both appear in the same column of the periodic table. Uh, without really knowing anything else about those two elements, we can predict that they'll act in similar ways. Uh, and it gets even cooler, so I'm going to talk about some of the other periodic trends later on in this video, but first of all I want to touch on how the periodic table is organized and what information uh, you can get from each element's little square on the table. So for this video I'm using ptable.com, which is a really, really excellent uh, interactive periodic table that I use all the time. It's great because you can just hover your mouse over any element and it'll pop up all this information. You can click on, for example, titanium and it will load this information about the element uh, basically from like the Wikipedia page. It will show you a picture and everything. Uh, but what I really want to focus on is the, uh, the little element squares that pop up. And so every periodic table is going to be different, but they're all going to have essentially the same basic, you know, amount of information. So we're going to start out with every element is going to have, first of all, its element symbol. So for example, for titanium, TI. Uh, and this is the same in every single language. So even if, you know, someone else doesn't speak the same language as you and you write out a chemical equation, they can still understand what you've put down, what elements you're using, what molecules are reacting, even if they don't say the word titanium the same in their language. So the name titanium will change from language to language, but the element symbol will not. The next thing that I'll point out is the little number at the top here. So you'll notice that each element on the table increases by a number of one. So we start with hydrogen one, helium two, lithium three. Those are the atomic numbers. And what that means is the number of protons that are in the nucleus of that element. So titanium, for example, has 22 protons in it, and that's why it has atomic number 22. And all of the elements being arranged in order uh, is part of what makes it so interesting that we see these trends come up because we're just organizing them based on increasing number of protons starting the row over again once we hit uh, a full electron shell. And just based off of that, we end up seeing some really incredible patterns come up that will help us predict all kinds of things. Uh, so that's the atomic number. The last thing that will always be on every periodic table is the atomic mass. So that's the number that appears at the bottom here. So for titanium, that's the 47.867. Now every periodic table will have a different amount of precision for these numbers, so they won't always be the exact same number of decimal places, but what this essentially represents is what is this element's relative mass, so compared to other elements. So for example, hydrogen has a mass of 1.008, whereas carbon is 12.011. These are always listed in units of grams per mole. So essentially that means that one particle of hydrogen, a single hydrogen atom, weighs tw approximately 12 times less than a single particle of carbon. So just based off the ratio of one to 12. So how many 
protons an element has will always be the same no matter what. So titanium will always have 22 protons. The number of electrons and neutrons on this element will vary. So neutral titanium will have 22 electrons, but this number can change. You could have titanium with 21 electrons, but it would still be titanium. You can't have 21 protons on it and have it still be titanium. That would make it scandium. What you'll notice is that the uh, atomic mass here is approximately the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So for titanium, we have 22 protons. That means that we have about 25 neutrons in titanium on average, if the molar mass is around 47. Uh, you'll notice though that it's not exactly 47. It's not exactly 48 either. It's not a whole integer number. So that is because you can have different amounts of neutrons on this element. So let's look at carbon for example. Carbon is nearly 12 grams per mole. However, it's not exactly that. So the reason why is because about 99% of carbon has six neutrons on it. So six protons and six neutrons would add up to be 12. But about 1% of carbon is carbon 13, which has six protons and seven neutrons. So that would give it a mass of 13 instead. So this is just the average mass uh, based off of those two different uh, we call those isotopes of carbon when they have different numbers of neutrons in between the two of them. So that's pretty much all the information that will be on every periodic table. You'll notice that this one also has these numbers in the top here, the 2, 8, 10, and 2. Those uh, will not generally be on a lot of periodic tables. They're, they're known as the oxidation numbers. So for example, titanium will often be in the 2 oxidation state or the 8 oxidation state. Uh, don't worry about this for now. It's kind of related to the charge that they can have. One thing you'll probably be thinking is I'm used to a periodic table that has charges on it. So you may have seen that a lot in your high school chemistry classes that the periodic table will have charges and most of your university periodic tables will not. So you will want to get used to not having to rely on those charges and you'll find that it actually ends up being easier than you probably originally expected because you can figure out those charges uh, in other ways. But you'll, you'll learn more about that in your first year chemistry courses. Okay, so now that we've gone over the individual element boxes, now we can talk a little bit about how the table's organization makes it so much more useful than it originally appears. So like I said before, the elements are listed in order of atomic number, but they're not just listed in a single row. So what you can see is that after a certain point, the row will start over again and keep going and then start over again. Uh, until we reach the end of a new row. Uh, the rows are, by the way, called periods. And they end when we finish a complete electron shell. So all of these noble gases here on the far right side have a complete electron shell. And then once we start a new shell, we start an entirely new row. So that's why the periodic table isn't just, a, just listed as one straight row of elements, other than the fact that that would make it really hard to read. Uh, so based off of how we've uh, organized it like this, a lot of patterns are going to show up. So one of the first ones we can talk about is metallic character. The table is split really nicely into sections of metals, metalloids, and non-metals from left to right. So uh, on this interactive table, you can see we can highlight this metals at the top here. And what that will do is highlight all of the elements that are metals. And it's almost all of the periodic table. A huge chunk of the table is metals. Uh, so metals are often described as being shiny, lustrous, conductive. Uh, a lot of the time they are solid. Uh, in fact, the only metal that is not solid at room temperature is mercury, which is a liquid. But otherwise, they all share pretty much these same properties. Uh, meanwhile, nonmetals, these show up on the right side of the periodic table, and they will have kind of a lot of opposite properties. So they're usually bad conductors. A lot of them are liquids or gases. Some of them are solids, uh, but they can kind of be any phase. Uh, their appearance is usually kind of dull instead of being shiny. And then meanwhile, 
metalloids, these fall in between metals and nonmetals. So they kind of have properties of both. They can be good conductors while also being relatively dull. Uh, or they can have other properties as well. So it's not a black and white picture of metal versus non-metal. We also have these metalloids in between that kind of have properties of both. Another periodic trend we can predict is the different sizes of elements based off of where they appear on the periodic table. So you might be thinking, well, don't they just get bigger as you add more protons and neutrons to them? And the answer to that is kind of, but not quite. So if we were to list all of the elements in one row from element number one to element number 118, so the beginning to the end, that row would not just be strictly increasing in size. Uh, in fact, you would have a lot of fluctuation there. There, there are very much trends, but they're not going to increase just from low atomic number to high atomic number. Uh, you'll learn about exactly why this is in your first year chemistry class, but the general trend is that elements will increase in size as you go from top to bottom. So hydrogen will be the smallest in this column and francium would be the biggest one in this column. So a top to bottom trend. And that is consistent with the atomic number going up. So something with 87 protons, you would imagine, yes, that would be a lot bigger than something with one proton. And that's true in this case. However, the part of the trend that might seem a little bit backwards to you is that they also increase from right to left. So argon is smaller than chlorine and chlorine should be smaller than sulfur. So essentially the biggest thing in this row should be sodium. And that's the general trend. There are going to be things that don't follow the trend perfectly. However, uh, things will get bigger as you go from right to left and top to bottom. So francium should be one of the biggest things on the periodic table based off of that trend. So this is where I will stop for today. You'll learn about a lot more periodic trends in your first year chemistry class and why those trends occur. Uh, but for now, I hope you learned something new about the periodic table. Uh, and if not, at least got a good refresher on its usefulness and why it's something that you're going to be using for years to come in university, uh, not just in your chemistry classes.